Live from the Pix11 Social Media Center, the people, challenges, the events that shape the lives of New Yorkers. The search for common ground starts here, where we talk it out with Jay Dow. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Talk It Out. I'm Jay Dow. We've experienced two tragedies this week in two different parts of the country. A mass shooting in El Paso, Texas, another mass shooting in Dayton, Ohio. We have two different motives from what we know right now. One, very outspoken, the shooter, white supremacy, white nationalist. He had a motive, going after Latino immigrants down in Texas, opening fire in a Walmart, killing so many people. We have another shooter who opened fire on a crowded street in Dayton, Ohio at night. So many people walking around. Investigators still trying to get to the bottom of what happened. He killed his own sister. We wanted to set the record straight during this show because there's been a lot of talk about what should be the blame here, whether this is a discussion that should be led with mental health, whether we should be talking about white nationalism first or stricter gun control, which is always the conversation following one of these mass shootings. We're going to talk about all of that. I have a city councilman here with me in the studio to discuss all of this and so many other interviews that you're going to want to pay attention to. But first, let's set the stage starting with the White House. President Trump has been very outspoken on Twitter, saying a lot of things, but he just recently had a speech that he read from a teleprompter saying something very different. Listen to this. We'll talk about it on the other side. These barbaric slaughters are an assault upon our communities, an attack upon our nation, and a crime against all of humanity. Reading from a teleprompter, Trump zeroed in on the El Paso suspected gunman's alleged motive, outlined in a racist, anti-immigrant screed posted online moments before the attack. The shooter in El Paso posted a manifesto online consumed by racist hate. But the president failed to mention the accused shooter mirroring some of his own language about immigrants. This is an invasion. That's an invasion. Invasion. We have a country that's being invaded. The president's use of invasion on camera and in tweets echoed in the alleged gunman's manifesto, where he refers to a Hispanic invasion, despite him writing that Trump didn't originally inspire his views. Our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. These sinister ideologies must be defeated. Hate has no place in America. Trump's speech also laid out several policy ideas to address mass shootings, but didn't mention gun control measures like background checks, a noticeable change from his tweet just a couple of hours before when he wrote that Congress should pass strong background checks, perhaps marrying them with desperately needed immigration reform. Instead, Trump on camera repeating Republican talking points, tying mass shootings to social media, mental health issues, and violent video games. Mental illness and hatred pulls the trigger, not the gun. And advocating for the death penalty and so-called red flag laws. We must make sure that those judged to pose a grave risk to public safety do not have access to firearms. We want to make sure that we're having this discussion on a level playing field so that we're all talking about the same thing. We wanted to throw out some important definitions here because there's been a lot of confusion about what night white nationalism means, what white supremacist means, so we figured we'd define it. We'd read what this actually means. So nationalist, that's a, a nationalist is someone who strongly believes in the interest of one's own nation, however nation might be defined. A white nationalist, however, is generally a person who wants a nation of white people, whether that means creating a separate nation of just white people or pushing those who are not white out of their current nation depends on what branch of white nationalism you're talking. Now let's talk about supremacist. A supremacist believes a particular race or sex or other genetic or cultural characteristic is naturally superior to others. A white supremacist, a white supremacist believes that white people are naturally superior to others. I have Councilman Mark Levine here in the studio with me. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you, Jay. You helped to organize a vigil in Washington Heights in northern Manhattan a couple of days ago, one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the city, to talk about this, this discussion that we're having about what's important in this discussion and how we react to mass shootings. Well, I want to thank you, Jay, for reading out those definitions. It's clear hearing them that 
the President of the United States qualifies under every one of those categories. He's undoubtedly a white nationalist. That needs to be called out in the wake of these horrifying shootings. And we came together to do that uptown Monday night, a community that itself has been targeted, a community which is home to Latinos, to African Americans, to the LGBT community, to Jews, to Muslims. Every one of these groups has been targeted in a mass shooting by shooters motivated by right-wing white nationalist ideology. We need to call that out, and we need to hold Donald Trump accountable for inciting this hatred and for failing to curb the epidemic of guns in this country. Now, I don't have President Trump sitting here, but we did listen to that story, and we did hear him address the nation condemning racist ideology and white nationalism. Shouldn't we be paying attention to that and giving him credit for that? He can read off a teleprompter, just like he did after the horrifying march in Charlottesville. 24 hours after that teleprompter speech, he was calling the neo-Nazis fine people. And it didn't take him long after that teleprompter speech to revert to the same kind of hate-filled attacks that are his hallmark. He has undoubtedly inspired white nationalists in this country by using their very rhetoric, by demonizing people of color and immigrants, Muslims, religious minorities, and that is the ideology that undergirds an increasing number of terrorist attacks in this country. So, so the, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah. Uh, the shooter in Texas, in El Paso, uh, he put up a manifesto a couple of minutes before he opened fire and killed all of those people. And he made it a point to say, I am not doing this because of Donald Trump. So there's a debate there. And, and that information has led people to say, well, this should not be about Donald Trump. But I found it very interesting, a story uh, that aired uh, just a, a day or two ago, focused on what Latino immigrants are saying down in El Paso, how they feel. Uh, watch this, because it's very interesting to see how they perceived this shooting. More than 100 years ago, El Paso streetcars crossed back and forth between Mexico and Texas. Today, the vintage trolleys circle the heart of the city, and as passengers stare out the window at the borderland streetscape, they reflect on the horror that rattled their hometown. 20-year-old Clarissa Boone lives in Mexico and crosses the border to attend the University of Texas in El Paso. She says the Walmart shooting has cast an eerie feeling over both the cities of El Paso and Juarez. Did you feel protected here in El Paso from racism? Yeah, because I know that we are a lot of Hispanics here and we are always like a big community. So you never had to face that? No, I mean, people here are very supportive, very nice. And to have that coming here is like, I don't know. Let's band together El Paso strong and we all have a big corazón. It means a big heart. Big heart. Mike big heart. Patino is a retired combat veteran turned artist and community activist. He owns the Rock House Gallery in one of the most historic neighborhoods in the city. He describes El Paso as a modern day Ellis Island. How, how do you make sense of what's going on? It, it's horrific to uh, just understand that um, something like this could actually happen here. We've never been under siege this bad by a local homemade terrorist. The wound left on this city by the massacre of 22 people by a white supremacist has unleashed a wave of intense emotions. This parking lot corner by the Walmart has become a place for thousands to share in their grief. Because I wanted to pay my respects to the people who passed away at my Walmart. Um, it, it's hitting hard. It's hitting home. As we rode the El Paso streetcar talking with 37-year-old Rene Fierro, he felt a sense of optimism that the horrific shooting will not change the core spirit of the place he was born and raised. We have a very strong sense of family values. Does this shatter that sense of security that you have here? No, I don't think so. We're, uh, we're a safe community because the majority of the people, they have that uh, respect for one another. They don't cross those boundaries. So I want you to know that we're reading your comments. We see all of these comments coming in. A great discussion. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, but you know, not this show is not always going to be about straight news. Sometimes we want to have a conversation. That's the whole purpose of this show. And there's one comment that jumped out at me in particular that I wanted to read. Damon Lamont Reardon says, right or left, Democrat or Republican, we have both hands. Do something. 
I see human beings, not race. That's very important. So again, share the show, talk about it, talk it out. Let's do that. Uh, getting back to what the matter at hand here, Mark, you know, in if we're switching gears and talking about what happened in Dayton, there is no known motive. The investigators are still trying to get to the bottom of that. The role of mental health because of the shooter's history is playing a more prominent role in the headlines. The governor there introduced a set of bills, and I had a phone conversation, a Skype conversation with the head of the Firearms Association who represents four million gun owners in Ohio, and he strongly believes that this is a mental health conversation. What do you think? That is such a tired Republican talking point. They trotted out after every mass shooting. Mental health is a challenge for every society on earth. But there is no epidemic of mass shootings in Britain or Bangladesh or Japan or Romania. It's happening here because of the cancer of white nationalism and because of the easy availability of weapons of death, of assault rifles, of guns of all sorts, which are killing our people. And the governor of Ohio, who has done nothing but block sensible gun safety rules, has not only exposed his own state to danger, but one of the number one sources of guns used on the streets of New York City to kill people in this city is Ohio. The laws are so lax in Ohio that people go there to bring guns to our city to kill our people. So really, he has no leg to stand on, and he should be ashamed of himself by trotting out this talking point once again. I mentioned that I spoke with Dean Rake. He's the executive director of the Buckeye Firearms Association. This is part of our conversation. Watch this. What we think of when we see these things is we're honestly frustrated and a little bit angry because we think that after these things happen, the only thing anybody ever wanted, wants to talk about is passing some laws. And I honestly think we should be having a, a much better dialogue about mental health. I hear you saying that this conversation should be about mental health, but if someone who has mental health issues and also has a desire to kill someone and they're stopped but from purchasing a gun because of stricter gun laws, won't that save lives? Well, here's the issue. So let's keep talking about this uh, Dayton killer. Um, he went through a background check. And that background check didn't bring up any information whatever, including the fact that when he was in high school that he had a murder list, he had a rape list. Dean Reek did, did also did not want to talk about stricter gun control. Listen to this. So our point of view is that if you're not enforcing current laws, what good is it to pass more laws? No, nobody wants these dangerous individuals to have firearms or to do damage to anybody. Would it be in the public's interest to not only tighten up existing gun laws, but pass stricter ones in order to save lives? The, the laws are pretty strict on this. You know, if you're, if you're a felon, if there's any mental issue, uh, in your life, uh, if you've ever been committed to an institution, for example, you're not supposed to even be around guns. You, you can't carry them, you can't own them, you can't possess them in any way. I understand that these guns, in your opinion, are pretty common. That said, do they deserve to be out on the street in the numbers that they are right now? Well, I mean, we've seen incidents like this happen with shotguns. We've seen incidents like this happen with ordinary pistols. We've even seen people use cars or trucks to run up on the sidewalk or to run into a festival area where there are a lot of people and run people down. I mean, we can ban things all day long. In England right now, they're actually banning kitchen utensils, anything that's sharp and pointy. It gets to the point where it's a little ridiculous. We need to be dealing with the people who are having a mental issue or who are committing crimes. And if we were dealing directly with the problem, I think that we'd be seeing a lot fewer of these incidents. What do you think, Mark? It's true. No single act of gun safety measures would entirely end firearm murders in America. But that is no excuse for not acting. We could rein in this epidemic. We could reduce the incidence of these kinds of mass shootings. And yes, you can kill someone with the kitchen knife. That's true. But you can't kill 100 people in a matter of minutes the way you can with one of these high capacity assault weapons. We have got to get the weapons of war out of the hands of the people of this country. That is the only way 
we're going to make significant progress in reining this in. And we have to confront the ideology that is increasingly undergirding these attacks. We have now had more Americans killed since 9-11 by white nationalism than we have by radical Islamic terror. The number one terror threat in America now is white nationalism. The entire leadership of our law enforcement uh, community knows this. We have been woefully slow to reorient to address this threat from a law enforcement perspective, and we're going to continue to see attacks like this until we take on the real threat of white nationalism, until we get guns out of the hands of people in this country who are using them to kill fellow Americans. Councilman Mark Levine, I appreciate you coming in. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, sir. So we're going to keep on having this conversation, share the show, keep talking about it. If you see something, then obviously we should be talking about exactly what it is. There's an old saying, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. This conversation about mental illness, mental health, certainly important. Equally important is the conversation about recognizing how white nationalism is driving a lot of people to do very bad things. So let's keep talking it out. That's going to do it for us for another edition of Talk It Out. I'm Jay Dow. Follow me on Facebook at Jay Dow Journalist. Set up your alerts so you know when we're coming to you live from the Facebook Social Media Center here at PIX11. Take care. Thanks for watching.